Hey friends, we're back here at the City Garden and I just wanted to take you on a little tour around. We do it in sections. Right now we're in the potager or little vegetable garden. It's tiny with about 10 raised beds and here in the foreground is one of our favorite Native American perennials, the purple coneflower. So why don't we go back out at the entrance and we'll start there. Now before we go any further, I want to quickly recognize our garden tour sponsors. A big thank you to Gilbert H. Wild & Son, Sun Patience, Arkansas Parks & Tourism, Ralston Family Farms, First Community Bank, and Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. These tours would not be possible without them. Check out our sponsor page on my website, pallensmith.com, for more information. Hey, here we are on the north side entrance to my city garden. It's one I did many, many years ago. It's given me a lot of joy. It's matured nicely. And uh, I, if you're a gardener, you know that's one of the great benefits of gardens. If you get the design right, they just get better and better over the years. And um, so what I want to point out here is just this walkway. I just did some basic brick steps from the curb up. There used to be a pair of trees here, these columnar English oaks that you can see lining the street. And these two, interestingly enough, did not do so well here. Uh, they struggled for years, and so finally I just cut them out. That's what I do. If a plant doesn't work, get rid of it, plant something that works. And so now we're experimenting with lots of perennials. Uh, we're in high summer now, and you can see this beautiful blue fortune hyssop in bloom. The daylilies are wrapping up over here on this side. We still have a few on that side. We've mixed it with coleus and other plants, uh, as well as my uh, great friend, the sun patience here, that will give us a lot of flower power through the blooming season, as well as lantana. They really, really take the heat. But the focal point along here, along this picket fence, which surrounds the property, is uh, this arbor. This arbor went up very early on. It's held up so well. I made it out of treated pine and um, it has been there for almost 30 years now. Um, and we have a new dawn rose growing on it and I wish you could have seen it this past spring. It was absolutely spectacular. So why don't we step inside and let me show you kind of what's going on in here. When you step through, you come through this uh, sort of arbor, if you will, of large trees. There's four of them, one on each corner. And these are the, the old um, Magnolia solangiana. Some people call them the tulip trees. You know this plant. They bloom very early and sometimes they bloom so early. Well, that the, the problem is, is the frost hits them. But the last couple of years, they have been absolutely spectacular. Um, I planted them as young trees and now I, I wanted multi-trunk and you can see they're all multi-trunk. I love the gray bark on them. But when that bloom comes along, it's amazing. And then in the fall, the leaves all turn golden yellow, so you get another spectacular splash of color in the fall. This is what we call the rondelle. Um, it's uh, one of the largest lawns in this tiny garden. This garden's made up, as you may recall, of about nine different garden rooms. And um, what we're doing, doing here is experimenting in these beds with all kinds of uh, annuals and perennials and bulbs. This uh, garden is very much a, a place for me to experiment and share what I learned. For instance, look at this salvia. This is called Mystic Spires. Loves the heat. Um, it's, a, it's a great performer and I think it's showing out beautifully with these super cow petunias. If you struggle with petunias, the super cow is one you may want to consider. I've been very happy about how they're great spreaders. You can see they're spilling out onto the walk here. Um, there's our good friend, the coleus in the back, which just gives you that bold foliage, which I think is so good to juxtapose bloom to foliage in a garden. And then over here, we've got some grasses just for some textural contrast. Uh, some of these ornamental grasses are really nice to kind of break up those foliage plants like the coleus, as well as those plants that are great bloomers uh, like the sun patience. Uh, as well as lantana and other things that can really take the heat. This one is called Fireworks. It's a fountain grass. You've all seen fountain grasses, uh, the red fountain grass. This one I like because it's got some variegation in the leaf, so it seems to shimmer a little bit more in the light and create more visual interest. If we walk over here on this side, we're going to see our old friend, uh, the Fortune or the Blue Fortune Hyssop. And what I love about this plant is that it's a great reliable perennial. 
and it works so well with daylilies. This will bloom really until the first frost for us. But the thing that is so incredible about this plant for me is the fact that it is great habitat and a feeding ground for so many pollinators. And if you look closely, you will see this area is alive with bumblebees, honeybees, all kinds of little uh, butterflies and so forth. It's a great plant to help support our pollinator colonies. Uh, here's our grass again, the fireworks coming along nicely. This will just continue to improve. If you'll notice, we've got this set against a, a hedge, a dark green hedge. Um, this is a boxwood hedge that has been here for many years now, but it gives a nice green canvas to apply these different plants to. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out this little uh, kufia. It's a wonderful little plant, sometimes called the cigar plant. Let me just break off a piece of this so you can see it. Um, but the hummingbirds love these tubular little flowers. This is definitely an annual, so don't expect it to come back unless you live down in Zone 10 in deep Florida. It'd probably come back for you there. But it is a great performer for those of you who are struggling with the heat but love hummingbirds. So you can bet that's gonna come back year after year. Okay, so let's move along. Um, so as I said, we have four of these magnolia trees. So you come into this, again, shady area. The idea is coming in and out of sun and shade, which makes the visual experience more interesting. And then at this point, you step up onto some steps and you come onto the loggia. Now, uh, we've just cleared it off because we're getting ready to do some more production up here, more ideas for you all to use in your gardens. Uh, but it's a great place to just sit out uh, and enjoy the evenings. Uh, it's fantastic as an outdoor dining room and so forth. It's one of my favorite places. Um, and you'll see I've got some bird's nest ferns running along the edge. This is very, very shady. And so these bird nest ferns just in the same size pots are a great way to decorate a porch or a place that doesn't have a lot of sun. But this is a really pretty small area. It's only 12 feet wide by 24 feet long and it really does serve as a a room an outdoor room for I don't know probably about eight months out of the year here so as we move through we're back into sun uh, punctuated by a pair of big boxwoods uh, we just cut them back uh, with boxwood what you want to do is cut cut them back I don't I, I, I we shear these twice a year and we'll probably cut them back one more time uh, perhaps in late August, and then they will flush, that growth will harden off, and that will take them through the winter. This boxwood is one called Buxus microphylla. It is a, a, a Korean boxwood. Um, it has a very rounded leaf to it, you can see. Um, a lot of you have asked about the boxwoods that we grow at Moss Mountain Farm, one called Green Velvet. Green Velvet's actually a cross between the old European boxwood, which is struggling in our country with what's called boxwood decline syndrome. Uh, but they've crossed the Asian type with the European type and come up with this cross that is, seems to be resistant to boxwood decline syndrome. And one of those varieties that we grow is green velvet at the farm. Uh, you'll see some of those over here in just a moment. So this is just a, a pathway uh, where I'm experimenting with containers lots of different containers uh, of annuals and uh, herbs and tropicals and so forth. Uh, as we come around, you'll see the uh, hydrangea Annabelle that we've seen before. And look at the size of the panicles on this. I wanna show you these today because these are actually just right for cutting. I don't know about you, but I love to bring dried things in. Let me just open these clippers. And uh, we've talked about these before. Um, we saw them in full bloom where they were very creamy white, but now they're, they're maturing. And what, what I love to do is cut, cut these at any stem length and just take off the, the leaves like that. And at this stage, if you will hang these upside down, that'll cause all those little flowerets to, to hang to one, one area, or they'll all hang, better said, together on each side. Um, and then you can use these as soon as they dry 
in arrangements. Um, if they begin to turn brown, you can just take some floral tint of the same color, which I like very much. It's kind of chartreuse, celadon green. Uh, these are fantastic and will last a long time. So they make beautiful late summer wreaths, fall wreaths, and we use them a lot for Christmas decorating. So when you're planting your garden, think about some of those plants that you can actually use and bring inside. And this is one that I recommend, the good old Annabelle hydrangea or Lady Annabelle, it's sometimes called. So we come back around and then we're suddenly back in the shade. But if we look over my shoulder, you'll see the work yard here uh, and a hedge of hornbeam that we keep clipped with an arch in it. Um, it creates another one of those garden rooms uh, but I've mentioned, this is the green velvet boxwood that we talked about just a moment ago. You can see it's got a different color to it. Um, you can see that it has a little sharper point to the leaf. Uh, it's a boxwood that I actually prefer over the Buxus microphylla, the Korean boxwood that we just talked about. But uh, I started with very small plants here and they've grown beautifully to kind of create a, a walkway into this work yard which is important in any garden, right? You gotta have a work yard. Uh, but I like to have it concealed where I, I can close off the gates and not worry about it. I can put it aside. Now along here, we're using a lot of shade plants for obvious reasons. Um, this bed over here is really an experimental space for hosta. I love growing hosta in containers. I also love using hosta as a ground cover. Of course, if you live in an area where there are a lot of deer, you know that deer consider hosta uh, a very tasty treat. And if you had this many planted, they would consider it a, a salad bar to come and eat and graze on. Uh, but what we do here in the city is we're usually, this really is a ground cover. And what I love to do with hosta is allow it to come up through an evergreen ground cover. That's ideal like an English ivy or maybe a, a winter creeper of some sort. That can be a very good look. Now along here, you'll see some shade loving grasses, uh, lots of different kinds of ferns. We have holly fern here, we have heuchera, that great plant that can bring color uh, through the foliage and shady areas. It's really hard to beat. And then more ferns along here and different shade loving plants. So this is one of my favorite areas to work uh, during the heat of the day. When it's full sun, I'll retreat to this area and do some container designs. And uh, you'll see one here that I've been working on where I've used wire vine, uh, which is hardy up until zone seven, uh, maybe zone six. And then I've got the strawberry begonia, which is uh, um, a, a beautiful, it's not actually a begonia, but they call it that. And it has a white little flower on it um, in the spring. And then here I've got some, some Japanese painted ferns the idea here was to plant this in perennials and this container went through the entire winter and emerged and is more robust than ever. You'll see another example here where I have a hosta, I have this beautiful ogon grass and there's our friend the Japanese painted fern again in a perennial container so that came back again after, well, we dropped down to about 15 degrees this past year. They stayed outside the whole time. Now I flanked this hedge um, and you can see we have a portal or an entrance into yet another garden room. Uh, this is a Sasanqua hedge and in the fall you should see it in bloom. It's covered in pink flowers that look like butterflies have landed on this hedge. And I've made up an iron arch in here where I can always cut it and keep that shape. And then I've got a pair of containers here on either side where I'm experimenting with some shade tolerant grasses as well as some variegated ajuga. Hey, I know shady areas can be tough for a lot of you out there. For a little more help, if you wanna check out my Shade Perennials blog, do that. There's more information there. And just uh, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell. We'll let you know when we have other content going up and trust me we'll be talking about shade. I really appreciate you joining us. Keep your questions coming. We'll be answering them very soon and hey share our site with your friends. Happy gardening.